Asylum, Tropical Island Survival, Week 5, Day 1. It's week 5 and my equipment is starting to look a little worse for wear, so I think it would be wise to build myself a real workshop with better tools for making tools. I made an outline of where I wanted the building last week, and at least this time I don't have to build a cellar. I set it up adjacent to the rivulet because I intend to give it some kind of water wheel to supply mechanical power to various pieces of equipment, though I'm not sure how much I'll need. It'll have to be a rectangle to accommodate the equipment, rather than a more material efficient circle. If I make the workshop a roughly 15 by 10 by 8 rectangle, with 1 foot thick walls, then it's going to require a clay volume of 432 cubic feet just about equal to the 445 cubic feet of clay I have left over from the kitchen project. With the clay already in place, I started building the new hut using the same process as the last one. Support rods, stick weave, clay walls, thatched roof, which I'll make some adjustments to later. I made sure to leave a couple of round windows for where the water wheel shaft will pass through, using a piece of cord to make sure everything was straight. I was able to finish the walls before the end of the day, including a lunch break to switch out pots in the kiln, and now I'm going to go to bed early. Week 5, Day 2. It's a new day. Time to start building the roof of my workshop, and since I'm going to need a log for the water wheel shaft anyway, I'll have to cut down another palm tree after my morning chores. I made sure to choose a palm trunk that was mostly straight and narrow enough that I could lift the shaft section into place by myself. I set the fronds aside for filling in the roof thatch, along with the coconuts to replace the tree with. Then I cut down some more bamboo, tied them into a lattice over the workshop, and affixed the palm and bamboo fronds to fill the roof in. Now it's time to work on the fun part, the water wheel itself. I dug a couple of small holes near the shaft windows of the workshop on each side, and created a couple of A-frames to hold the axle up, chopping notches into them with my axe so they'd fit together more securely, in addition to tying them together with cord. I might even try drilling a hole through them and inserting a wooden peg later, but that'll take a while. Then I mounted the longest and thinnest log on top of the frames, being careful to thread it through the fragile clay windows without damaging them. For now, the axle just rests on top of the A-frames but I intend to replace them with more efficient bearings later. I drilled some holes in the axle to create spokes for the wheel using bamboo. I was worried about the spokes bending while the wheel was in motion, but then I thought about how a bicycle wheel doesn't twist when torque is applied against the wheel and axle, because they would have to squish the rim of the wheel and in turn stretch the spokes perpendicular to them. The spokes have a pretty high tensile strength, so it shouldn't be a problem. Once the spokes were finished, I bent some more bamboo to make the circumference of the wheel itself. I concluded that coconut shells have an almost perfect shape for catching a water jet, just like real hydroelectric turbines. So I made sure to mount them to the spokes or sturdier branches along the circumference of the wheel so they would not bend or be broken by water pressure. I gave the water wheel a little push test to see how well it turned, and I was a little surprised by how little force was needed to rotate the shaft lever arm doing its job. I could tell that filling the cups with water wasn't going to be enough to keep it rolling. There's still too much friction, so before the day ends, I'll rig up some quick and dirty bearings for the axle. I cut some short segments of bamboo, bundled them around the axle, and wrapped some thinner pieces of bamboo around them to hold them in place, called a race. It took some finagling to get everything to fit in its proper place without falling out, but it did cause the axle to rotate a whole lot more smoothly. I can tell there are still plenty of energy losses in these bearings though, particularly where the rollers have to pass over the partitions on the outside race. I'd like to spend the remainder of the evening planning and making some basic calculations. I have a decision to make regarding the water wheel at this point. I can either dribble the water over the top of the wheel, or I can jet the water underneath it. Normally the former is used when you have a high pressure and low volume of water, and the latter is used when you have low pressure and high volume. The problem is that, with this rivulet, I have low pressure and low volume. 
I'm not likely to ever be able to get more than 8 feet of pressure head or 2 to 3 psi. If I could build a reservoir and put a nozzle on it, I might be able to multiply that pressure by 10 or even 100 times. But because the rivulet isn't flowing that fast, it means the reservoir would drain out faster than the rivulet could fill it. So I won't be able to run the mill for more than a few minutes at a time. Basically, the reservoir would function like a big water battery. I honestly can't figure out which is going to be better, but since I've basically got nothing but time, I think I'll try both and go with whatever works best. If nothing else, the reservoir can act as a backup for when I need more power or speed. Week 5, Day 3 After my morning chores, I decided to get started on the reservoir system. I built the reservoir off the back wall of the workshop so I'd have one less wall to make. I needed a little extra clay to finish it, and the workshop floor was on a gradient, so I took my dirt from there. Two birds with one stone. As usual, I started with a bamboo frame, which didn't take much to make, but while I was at it, I carved out the partitions in some lengths of bamboo to make a trough, which I then rested over the top of the framework and connected to the rivulet. I just wanted to test the over-the-top effectiveness of the water wheel, since it would be the simplest flow option. It took a little push to get going, but it did turn, if slowly. It also made water more easily available to me when I started daubing on the mud. The reservoir is about 2 by 11 by 8 feet and 1 foot thick. I built the water wheel on the downhill side of the workshop, and one wall is already built. So I'm going to need about 100 cubic feet of dirt. I'll probably have just enough when I'm done leveling the workshop floor. It took a couple of hours to dig and a couple more to daub. While I was at the daubing, though, I made a piece of hollowed out bamboo and installed it at the bottom of the reservoir wall to act as a nozzle, taking care to aim it directly at the water wheel cups by looking through it. I drilled a hole in the side of this nozzle and put another smaller piece of bamboo through it perpendicularly. This cross piece also had a hole drilled in it, so when I turn it, it'll function as a valve so I can turn the water flow on and off. Now that the walls are finished, I'll leave the reservoir to dry for a day before I start filling it with water. I have a few more hours left in the day, so while I'm cooking a late lunch, I'll take a minute to think about the equipment I want to power with the water wheel. In order to replace my axe heads and other blades in the future, I'm going to need a grindstone, which would also make an excellent flywheel for a lathe. I'll want to eventually build and attach a rope spinning tool to the lathe as well. A drill press would also be nice, but I can get to that later. A table saw of some kind would be great, but I don't think I have the ability to make a circular blade or even a strong enough string for a bandsaw. Oh yes, and I need a potting wheel. None of these machines will be able to do anything though unless I can connect them to the axle of the water wheel. I don't think I can really make proper gears at this time, so I think belts would be easier. The beauty of using belts instead of gears is that they can twist a little to power machines rotating on different axes. Fortunately, I've been collecting latex for several days now, so I'll probably have enough to make some long rubber belts. I think these kinds of belts were actually used in early machine shops before everything was electrified. I started on the belts by cutting some bamboo cord and weaving it into some rough belts just a little bit longer than I thought I'd need, just in case. I can always take up the slack later. Next, because I expect the water wheel to rotate very slowly, I put a large diameter wheel on it. By hooking it up to a smaller wheel with a belt, I can step up the speed. I couldn't machine a solid wheel of the proper size with the tools and materials I had, and I wasn't sure if a spoked wheel would be able to handle the torque. I decided to drill a small hole in the axle, insert some bamboo or other flexible reed, and wrap them around the axle in the direction of its normal rotation, tying them to each other as I went, and layering them up until the wheel was about the size I wanted. It's not perfectly round, but because it's driving a belt, it won't need to be. I've got a couple more hours before bed, so I think I'd like to get a head start on the lathe. I built a workbench to mount the lathe to, constructed of wood and bamboo. It won't be heavy enough to dampen out the inevitable shaking my lathe will experience, but clay would be far too fragile, at least by itself, and I don't want the lathe to break. 
I don't entirely know what I'm doing, so this first version is going to be as crude and as messy as I can make it, because there are a lot of elements I can improve on once I have the most primitive lathe available to me. As such, I started by making a simple axle and A-frames, using the same trick I used on the water wheel to make a pulley to drive the lathe. Finally, I needed a way to hold the parts while they were being shaped. But this one was actually kind of tricky because the mechanism will, at times, have to be larger than the diameter of the axle. It was getting dark at this point though, so I got several pieces of bamboo, sticks and the like, and wrapped them around the axle with a cord, such that when the cord is tightened, it'll grip the workpiece. That should wrap me up for the day, but before I go to bed, I'll slather the last of my latex on the rollers to give them better traction by tomorrow morning. Week 5, Day 4 I did my morning chores as quickly as I could, so I could test out my new lathe. By this time, the belt was dry, if still a little sticky. This was actually quite exciting for me because I don't have a lathe of my own at home. The first thing I really felt like I needed to make on the lathe was some bearings to make everything run smoother, so I found some sticks and secured them inside the grips. I then sharpened my knife and held it against the edge of the stick to make it round. I've done this trick with a power drill at home before. This allowed me to make rough but round bearings of nearly identical sizes. As planned, I replaced the bearings on the water wheel first, since they could afford to be the crudest. But I found another problem. I can't make a perfectly smooth outer race on my lathe because I don't have wide enough logs to turn them on, nor do I want to go cutting down any trees. However, based on the bearings I made the other day, I had an idea to improve them by splitting a piece of bamboo down the middle before twisting it into a circle. I was able to create several thin but perfectly flat tracks that I could lay my rollers on. I used the same trick to make the inner race connecting to the axle. Once the bearings were completed, I stopped the water wheel and took a moment to replace my old bearings, cutting notches in the log to fit the inner races, mounting the new bearings in the windows, and securing them to the frames of the hut and A-frames which can stand by to support the water wheel when the bearings inevitably have to be replaced again, or as a backup if the bearings fail by surprise. I immediately saw a marked improvement in the water wheel's performance, as it's now a relative breeze to get it going, even if it takes a little more force to overcome its inertia. It spins the lathe much faster now. I'll repeat this process and make some much smaller bearings for the lathe itself. Once I was done making and installing the new lathe bearings, the next thing I really needed to do was to turn the gripper into a vise to keep parts centered and to keep them from wobbling. First, I turned a wheel out of the remains of the palm log, carving a key slot into the center of it so it could be affixed to the axle. I then drilled some holes in the wheel at regular intervals and installed some pegs in them. Then I used my axe to split some pieces of wood into slats about an inch thick which I whittled into triangles with slots to the best of my ability. By mounting these triangles on the aforementioned pegs, I was able to make a gripper shaped kind of like a camera aperture. By wrapping a cord around the perimeter of this aperture and tightening it, I could grip the workpiece strongly and evenly. The best part is it's more or less guaranteed to always force the workpiece to sit at the central axis of the lathe. Finally, I turned one last slat into a wooden disc, and drilled holes in it to match the pegs in the lathe wheel, fixed it in place. It was a little extra work, but it looks really nice, clean and mechanical, and it should also be well balanced. I think that's everything I need to start producing some fine wooden machine parts. I inaugurated my machine shop by making a tension wheel to keep the belt taut. I threaded it with several strands of bamboo cord, tied them to a peg I drove into the wall, and used a little stick to twist the cords until they were taut. It was a breeze to build a simple tool for twisting rope, now that I have a working lathe. I made a small wheel with three holes in it, and to these holes I attached wheels with whittled teeth that rotated against the central shaft of the first. This caused them to rotate counter to the larger wheel. I put some pegs in the small wheels where I can wedge bamboo, hibiscus, grass, or other fibers and twist them into rope in a matter of minutes. I'll spend some time this evening making some spare string and rope, as my trout lines will probably need to be replaced soon. 
My axe and knife are starting to wear down pretty badly, so I'll need to start working on that grindstone tomorrow. Week 5, Day 5 After my morning chores, I dug up some clay and formed four large keyed discs, which I left to dry in the sun. The first will be a grindstone for my tools, though I'm not sure if clay will be strong enough. The second will be a potting wheel, and the remaining two I'll make into millstones for grinding dried taro, yam, and breadfruit into flour in the future. I scored some spiral grooves in their surfaces with my finger while they were still wet. This is so that when they're turned against each other, the spirals will drive larger particles toward the center of the grindstone, leaving only smaller particles to make it out of the grooves, and will cut and grind the plants like scissors into smaller and smaller pieces. I also made a lip around the outside edge of the lower millstone, and put a spout on the side where flour can come out, and some holes and a depression in the upper millstone, so I can just dump material on top of it to funnel down and be ground up automatically. With the stones drying, I started working on a drill press, beginning with a tall rectangular bamboo frame to hold the mechanism, using arches at the top to give myself a little extra space for machinery that would go underneath. Next, I made some small bearings and a keyed belt wheel to install at the top of the frame. For the drill itself, I used a piece of sharp stone fixed to the end of a stick and carved a long key onto it to maintain torque with the drive wheel when sliding it up and down. I attached another small bearing to the drill shaft and a couple of pieces of bamboo to the bearing itself, connecting it to the frame and keeping the shaft centered. Finally, I put a third bearing in between the first two and put several small bowstrings of bamboo between it and the bottom bearing, such that when I push it down on the center bearing with my hands or with a lever, it'll press the drill shaft down to cold distance with a controlled amount of force and spring back up again. I tried to give this a test, but found that when I connected the belt to the drive wheel on top of the drill press, the tension from the belt tipped the drill press over. I took some time to tie sticks around the base of the drill press to create a basket, and filled it with rocks to weigh it down. This helps, but I think later I'll fill both the drill press and the lathe in clay to make them more massive and therefore absorptive of vibrations for better machining quality. This reminded me though that I wanted to do a bit more work on the lathe, so I finished it off with a flat work surface where I can hold the cutting tools more precisely. After lunch, I got some more bamboo and constructed the additional framework around the lathe. Then I spent about an hour digging up the dirt I'll need to fill it in. I got most of it from digging a trench around the workshop. This will not only help protect the building in the event of torrential tropical rain and flooding, but it'll also give me a place to plant various useful plants right next to the workshop where I'll need them. I spent about another hour adding the clay to the lathe and drill press. I didn't use the clay to affix them to the floor though, because I'm not quite certain where I want them just yet. I've left my machinery to dry, but I've still got several hours before the end of the day. I think I'll plant my bamboo sprouts around the workshop, as it's probably the plant I'll be processing there the most once it's grown in. I'll plant most of the bamboo around the back, where it'll be well watered by the rivulet and absorb a lot of the noise from the water wheel. I think I'll also go out and gather some harakeke and hibiscus plants to go in front, both because they're useful for fiber and paper, but also because they'll look pretty there once they've grown in and begun to flower. The sun is starting to set, and I'm quite satisfied with my transplanting operation. The trench should help keep them watered while they settle in. I never really enjoyed transplanting for mom back home, but maybe that's because it didn't serve a practical purpose from my perspective. At least this will serve function as well as form. Week 5, Day 6 After my morning chores, I pulled in my trot lines as they were getting a bit worse for wear anyway. There must be some big, tough fish down there. I put the grindstone into the kiln for the day. Now that I have my machines, I need to figure out what to make with them. My most time-consuming and onerous daily task is fetching the fish from my lines, so I've got an idea for a way to make it easier. However, it's going to require a lot more rope. If a single fully grown bamboo stalk is about 50 feet tall, call it 35 feet to account for height averages, 
and you could get up to 120 cords of one millimeter diameter out of a single stock, then I could theoretically use one bamboo stock to make a cord 4,200 feet long, about 1.3 kilometers, longer than the entire island, meaning I can probably get plenty of cord for this task using a single stock. First though, I need something to help me cut the cord from the bamboo. Stripping the cord manually with my knife works, but it's tedious, slow, and kind of puts my fingers at risk of being cut every time I do it. I'll attach a piece of bamboo to my pocket knife and create a sort of potato peeler that protects my fingers and allows me to angle the knife precisely so I can quickly pull a bamboo stalk into thin strips. It took a couple of hours to build the peeler and strip the cord, but mere minutes to twist it all into ropes. Next, I turned a few pulleys on the lathe and used a couple of pieces of bamboo to make a shaft, a crank handle, and rope guides for each pulley to keep the ropes from slipping off of them. I attached one of the pulleys to the crankshaft, stabbed the shaft into the sand on the beach, and piled up some rocks around it to make it secure. I then attached the other two pulleys to long bamboo shafts, each with a float and an anchor line tied to the rope guide, using a bunch of rocks tied together as a weight. I tied my rope into a loop, wrapped it around the crank, and took the other two pulleys out to sea. Once I got out about as far as I could reach with the rope, I dropped the floating pulleys in the water, attached the rope to them, and pulled it taut before dropping the weights, forming a big triangle of rope so the snoods don't end up getting tangled together, as well as creating a larger fishing area. I then headed back to the beach and gave it a test. With the crank, I found I could quite easily convey the whole thing and attach my snoods as I went. Now I don't have to go out on the water to retrieve my fish every morning. I can bring them to me. I have a few hours left before the end of the day, so I'll spend some time fixing my equipment for the Sabbath, specifically my shoes, jacket, trousers, hat, backpack, and mat, since those are the items I use pretty much every day. I won't be needing the bow drill as much anymore because I have the drill press now to both cut holes and start fires. And because I don't have to go out and pull in my fishing lines anymore, I won't be needing the kayak as often. Week 5, Day 7 I know it's kind of like work, but my grindstone and potting pool finished drying the other day. So after reeling in my fish and bringing home the fruit and eggs in the morning, I mounted the grindstone on the lathe and the potting wheel on the drill press to test them. One great thing about having the grindstone on the lathe is that it will also act as a flywheel to store mechanical energy like a battery to keep the lathe moving when I try to cut stuff on it, resisting deceleration during cutting, so I should be able to make parts a little more smoothly. I wasn't sure if the clay grindstone would be able to handle the rotation forces, but it seems to be working just fine. If anything, its only flaw is that it sharpens too slowly because of the finer grit of the clay compared to something like sand. Given enough patience, however, it produces a very fine cutting edge, which I applied to both my worn-out pocket knife and my stone axe. As for the potting wheel, I put a hole in it so it could be turned by the drill press if the shaft was pushed all the way down into it. This will result in pots with a hole in the bottom of them, but that should be easy for me to fix when I'm finished. I tried to think of a few more relaxing things to do today, but the only thing that immediately came to mind was to do a bit more gardening around the base, even though it's still kind of manual labor. I used my hoe to dig a shallow trench around the kitchen hut, setting aside the clay for pottery later. Then I went out and collected some plants that I thought would be useful to have near at hand. Since they've been so useful, I decided to plant some of the vanilla grass plants around the kitchen, digging up the runners instead of the parent plant for transplanting, so there will be more of them to use in the future. I made sure to avoid making the trench completely ring the building, since I don't want any plants too close to the kiln, where they might catch fire. I briefly considered planting the sugar cane around the kitchen hut, but they would eventually hide it and block the view through the windows. So instead, I planted all my sugarcane sprouts next to the rivulet closest to the kitchen, like I did for the bamboo near the workshop. The little garden around the kitchen hut is going to look a bit drab, though, if all the plants around it are going to be green. So I'll add a few banana plant sprouts, as their height, 
flowers, and fruit will create a nice visual contrast with the vanilla grass when they're finished growing in. Furthermore, I'll be able to conveniently reach out of the kitchen and grab the leaves for packing food or as disposable plates. It's worth noting that since I started preparing my food here, this is where the bat has started hanging out, namely from the window shutter, where I keep feeding it bananas. So having banana plants on hand for that will be a plus. It's probably not a safe place for it to be hanging from, though, so I should take a few minutes to install a proper perch over the window for it to hang from. After lunch, I decided to work on something that's more work than I should be doing on a Sabbath, but I didn't have any better ideas for what to do with myself. I don't want to be simply dumping my waste in the ocean, or leaving it lying around in the woods to bring disease to some unsuspecting animal, or myself. I need to build a composting bin, but I want to make sure it breaks down the waste as quickly and efficiently as possible. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, this is a subject I was already somewhat studied in for a project I was planning before I even came to this island. What's needed for rapid decomposition is a balance of water and air in the waste. Enough air that the smelly and pathogenic anaerobic microbes can't grow in the waste, but still moist enough that the good aerobic microbes don't dry out. To do this, I envisioned placing a whole bunch of hollowed out bamboo tubes in the bin to give air a way to diffuse in, and water a place to drain out, covering it with a lid of water repellent leaves, like banana, so a little water can get in when it rains, but water that evaporates in the heat will condense back down. I cut down several bamboo stalks and constructed a raised box with a trap door on the bottom, knowing that the stuff on the bottom will be the first to finish decomposing, and therefore what I'll want to collect first as compost. I also split several of the stalks in half, chopped out the partitions, and laid them crisscrossed with their open sides down in the box to allow air to diffuse through them, before capping the box with banana leaves and filling it with what waste I have been unfortunate enough to collect so far. The average human creates about two cups of feces per day, so at this point I have a little over five gallons of the unfortunate material piled up a fair distance downwind from my base. It's an onerous job for a Saturday, but I really feel like it needs to be done. This job left me sweatier and smellier than I normally should be on a Saturday, so I treated myself to a nice shower and bath before it got dark, using the workshop reservoir as a tiny pool, and the dribbling trough for the water wheel shifted off to the side to act as a shower. No need for that special shower pot after all. I'll have to find another use for it. The reservoir was a little tight for swimming, but it's much better for me than swimming in the ocean. Now that I'm clean and fresh, I'm going to chill out, have dinner, and watch the sunset and stars until it's time to go to bed. Blooper reel. I dug a cup. I... Uh, <clears throat> I can tell... The I can tell that, I can tell that, filling the cups, I drilled a hole, <clears throat> excuse me, I built a work, I built a workbench to mount the blank to, typos, the next thing I really needed to do, did, 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 did. I scored some spiral glue, I spored some spiral grooves, I spored some, it took some time to tie it took some time to tie sticks down. Uh, it took some time to tie sticks around the base. It took some time to tie sticks around the base of the drill press to create a basket. Oh, I took some time. I took some time to. Dr I took some time to try. I took some time to tie sticks, and the ends not be, and the ends not being too soft for. And the ends. And the ends being too soft for cord, that's a typo. Are we on? Okay, hold on a sec. 4,200 feet long. So I'll add a few banana prints. Furthermore, I'll be able to conveniently reach out of the kitchen and grab the leaves for, pack for, packing, for packing food or as disposable plates. There's something itching in my ear. Come on! Uh, that movie was a nightmare and a half. Oh, let me see, where was I? Hey there, you made it all the way to the end. Thanks for listening. 
I am planning on making a new video slash audio segment every week for the foreseeable future, concurrent with my stay on the island. Uh, if I can drag myself away from making stuff in the workshop, that is. So, if you liked this and want to listen to the next one as soon as I'm done machining a ballista to fire them to the mainland, you can press the bell button under the video, and I'll fire it on a ballistic trajectory to your rough coordinates as soon as it's ready. Now, I have no intention of monetizing these videos, and I hate being the squeaky wheel, but it would still help me out if you could press the subscribe button, because that also tells the YouTube algorithm to recommend my videos to you and others who watch the same videos you do. Incidentally, I've learned a bit more about how the algorithm works, and I feel like I owe them an apology for sassing them in last month's outros. They're actually trying their best, they just don't know who to share these videos with yet because they're so new. However, I think you can, so, if you feel so inclined, it would help me out more than anything else if you could share this video with someone you know who you think would enjoy it. And since you apparently enjoyed it enough to watch to the end, there's also a like button under the video that you can use to tell me so, which not only helps the algorithm, but it also just makes me feel good. It's nice to know that your craftsmanship is appreciated, even if all I'm crafting right now are words. There is also a dislike button that you can press if you didn't like it, which is fair, but if I made a mistake, I'd like to know what I did wrong, so I can at least do better next time. So, perfect segue, let me know your suggestions, corrections, tips, and tricks in the comments section. I just love making stuff, and learning how to get better at it, and I'd love to hear your stories about making stuff. Maybe a mistake you learned from, or, even better, something you made that you were really proud of. I look forward to hearing them. That said, thanks again for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.